Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful day you've given to us. We thank you for the love that you have for us. We ask that you be with those, to comfort those who have lost loved ones. We also ask for your wisdom and guidance in our meetings today. In Christ's name, amen. Julia Pitts here. Don Garvin. Oh, Bill Anglin. Here. Bill John Baker. Here. Jack Baker. Here. Harley Bezer. Here. Bradley Cobb. Uh -huh. Joe Crittenden. Here. Jody Fishinghawk. Meredith Braley. Here. <coughs> Janelle Fulbright. Chuck Hoskin Jr. Here. Hannah Glory Jordan. Present. Curtis Snell. Here. Chris Snell. David Thornton. I do have a Thank you. Uh, next, we have the approval of the minutes from the June 17th meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you. And next, we have our reports. First up uh, is Diane Kelly from Career Services. Thank you. <coughs> The report was handed out, and I do apologize. Kim was on vacation last week, and we thought we got it over to Lita in plenty of time, but I guess we didn't. Um, if you want to look over that, uh, I just will kind of highlight a couple of things. Uh, we hosted a cultural enrichment day over at Job Corps for our, our uh, summer youth and our literacy students. And uh, first time we'd ever done this. Uh, had a lot of help from uh, community development and some of the other departments who went over and helped us with our cultural day. Uh, outstanding turnout. We had about 426 people that showed up and we took pictures out in the ground with the chief and somebody climbed up on the gym and took pictures of it and uh, we're planning something more for next year and tying in the careers with it. But uh, it was an exceptionally fine day. We did a traditional hog fry. Some of these kids had never had hog meat, believe it or not. And uh, they were really uh, appreciative of the things that we did with them. Um, our um, project manager, Benny Stevenson, was here to monitor back in the month of June. Uh, had some very positive comments to make. Uh, we sent Rob Doherty down to Dallas and he came back and did some training for our staff on Norman culture. And uh, we ordered a bunch of stuff for the educational uh, area uh, for some of the new initiatives for next year. Uh, we've got um, a lot of good positive things going on. Jay Little John and his staff are doing an outstanding job as far as recruiting students. So we hosted the U.S. Border Patrol. They were here. They're coming back. And as a result of them coming to our center, now they're looking at visiting a lot of the other centers in the nation. And the National and Regional Director thanked us for bringing the Border Patrol in. So uh, with that, uh, they're going to be able to recruit a lot of students from some of these other job force centers. Our summer break started in uh, June and uh, kids will start coming back this week. Um, we're combining our vocational training programs and our vocational rehabilitation programs. Uh, we've got four counselors, case managers, and they're going to be working so that we have one individual per county. So that if you come into any of our field offices in Delaware County, Sequoia County, there will be a person there that can do the vocational or the vocational training and they will be working strictly in that area. They will not be working four or five counties or doing field days. They will be working strictly in those areas. We've hired a lady by the name of Cheryl Adams in our Catoosa office. She'll be working there full time and she will be charged with doing this as well. So we will have an array of people that can do multi-task things so that uh, when you call in there should be somebody there. Uh, do you all have any questions about our report? <coughs> Diane, on this uh, Border Patrol training, is that a government job? Yes, that it government? is. In fact, after two or three years with the Border Patrol, a person could be making up to $70,000 a year. And then I just saw the uh, highlights of it. Are they giving training? Is that what, it, what it's about? Uh, what they do is they take them and they train them. They have to learn how to speak Spanish. They will run them through a four-week crash course in Spanish and uh, they will let them kind of have an idea of where they want to work. They'll give them about two or three locations where they're needing the help and uh, they let them pick whether they want to ride a horse, ride a uh, four-wheeler, or if they want to uh, walk, 
or if they want to um, drive a pickup. And they'll have they'll furnish the vehicles and they will furnish their room and board. And uh, they're kind of like a deputized person, but they run them through some training before they actually put them out there. But uh, learning Hispanic is one of the main areas that they're going to run them through. And uh, they are hurting for Native Americans and they are hurting for blacks at this time. And that was what they sent out the information on. They saw 63 people when they came over to Talking Leaves. Uh, not all of them were students, but they were people in the area because we did send information out. And they're coming back again, I think, at the end of this month, the first part of August. Or maybe during the Cherokee holiday because we told them about that. So they may be here during that time period. And, and I got a follow up question, Diane. What about the funding, uh, shortfall of funding cuts in Talking Leaf Job Board? How is it going to affect us here? Uh, job <coughs> Board uh, got their five-year uh, contract funded, and the information that we got from uh, LaVera Leonard in our national office is that uh, the lobbying groups for Job Corps, which is about the fourth largest in behind Teamsters and AARP and the National Rifle, they're doing fairly well with the Senate. It's the Congress where they may have a little problem, but they may wait until after the uh, new politicians are seated to run that and run on a continuing resolution is what they're proposing. And funding for Job Corps has been fairly well. We don't anticipate a big, huge increase, but uh, if there's additional monies that come in, then they will notify the centers uh, and we can go in and compete for it. Okay. Well, I, I was under the impression that they were going to look at cutting the funding. Well, uh, the information we got, which was last week, was that it's looking fairly well right now with the Department of Labor. Job Corps in labor always fares probably better than a lot of the other programs. It's the others that usually take the hit. And one more question. The uh, CDL training uh, course, did you ever get it constructed over here, Dr. Uh, we met with American Trucking last week in Catoosa, and um, Mr. Francis is coming down to meet with us in the next week or two. Uh, they're going to work with us to build possibly a track on the back side of the center so that they can run the trucks and the training will be here and in Tulsa and they will offer it on the weekend and uh, we're moving to try to get something in place by this fall, at least by September. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next we have the Executive Director's Report from <coughs> Dr. Morton. Good afternoon. You know, we always, before we start to report, we bombard you with material so that you'll be reading that material and we can just whiz right through it. Uh, the material that you have on before you was uh, prepared under the leadership of uh, Donna Gord, who is Director of uh, Service Learning <coughs> for Education Services for the Cherokee Nation. Donna is uh, here today. She did an excellent job in, uh, in preparing the material. We frequently hear from public school teachers that uh, I'd, I'd like to teach something about Oklahoma history, but I do not have the material. And as uh, because of uh, the time constraints imposed by No Child Left Behind, so m many things have fallen from the curriculum. <coughs> so uh, in answer to that, uh, uh, Donna and her uh, staff and uh, volunteers and consultants uh, put together a um, history text that could be used, it's labeled as secondary, it could be used for you know, mid-school, junior high on through secondary. And realizing that uh, teachers are more apt to use uh, actual curriculum material if it has built-in study guides, built-in uh, lesson plans. So <coughs> hence the um, free wing notebook that uh, provides that, plus provides the opportunity for addition to. If someone runs across an article in a newspaper and thinks, you know, I'd like to have that in my history book, then they can, they can do that. So <coughs> we uh, think that uh, Donna did an excellent job uh, putting this together and we will be distributing this to public schools. We'll have a uh, training session first on how to use the the book. Donna, would you like to add anything? Only that it was my privilege to have this project even though it was extra work. Um, some of the 
most interesting work I've ever done because I learned a lot in the process. Mr. Baker, can you? Yeah, and Donna, I appreciate your hard work and, and everything, and, and this is nothing to you whatsoever other than how can we possibly, as a Cherokee Nation, come up with a history book and leave out one of the chiefs? I mean, no mention whatsoever of, of Joe Bird. Mm -hmm. not, not even a byline or a, uh, or anything. I mean, that, that is, that's not right. Probably an oversight, and we'll take care of that I, with I some insert. I have answers. to tell you, it was an oversight, and I think I told Dr. Morton I was so glad when um, my stepfather asked me the same question because it prepared me to answer it. We were just under such a tight deadline, and the last few pages of that book were coming together. It didn't have a picture of Ross Swimmer in it either. <laughs> And it does now, though. It does now, but it, it also doesn't have all of the chiefs in it, Mr. Baker. It well, just doesn't. Modern and day it does. All but one. And I, I can only say I apologize. And the rest of the material, which is being completed in the binder, will certainly include the history surrounding that time period. Thank you. Mr. Well, how many of these books here did we print? Our first printing... It's designed to you know bring teachers in, teach them how to use the book, mm -hmm. and then we'll print as many as we need. Um, is there any reason, Donna, that we couldn't include uh, Chief Bird in the next printing? Absolutely no reason whatsoever. It, and it truly was an oversight in the board. It absolutely was. Possibly when you get that portion of the book completed, and reprinted, could you provide the council with a copy of that book? And we probably replace those that we have out. Did we not do a big printing of the no. first group? So we, it wouldn't be a hardship. It would not be a hardship at all. Yeah. Yeah. Because I had the same question. I, I could see where we had started with uh, Chief Keeler and come forward and I, I thought, well, if this is going to be used as a sort of our history book, it's an excellent book, but that was the only thing I could see missing. We needed a page Such there to fill in history. that portion of history. It doesn't have any pictures of the council either, and I apologize for that. That might be a good one for right back here. Fly leaf cover. Mr. Hoskins. Here. <laughs> <laughs> right there, that would be so good. there are a number of these that are being issued to public schools? None have been issued. None have been issued. Will any of these be issued, the ones that omit? The reference to Chief Bird? For the teaching session and for the introductory session, probably yes. <coughs> and is it feasible to, to put, put an eight and a half by 11 slip? Yes. Noting the omission and, and then also the binder will reference the Chief Very definitely. Okay. Thank you. For that. Mr. Baker. Yes. When do you expect to have the other blank sections done? <laughs> I said you had the first 10. The, uh, the drafts have already been done for the narratives, and um, Chief Smith has actually asked some volunteers, including yourself, people with knowledge you don't have to actually research the, the, the information to do some writing, and um, a number of people are writing now, and what we'll do is uh, add the lesson plans to those sections where the narratives are being completed. And our goal is, if they're supposed to finish their, their part of the writing by August, and we would hope to have the materials ready for um, three to four months after that. Thank you. Okay. Are there other questions on this? And you have okay. Of course, this week we, well, as you heard from uh, the Tribal Youth Council last evening, the first ever Cherokee Arts Institute uh, going on at uh, Sequoia this week. Uh, we're already planning next week's program, which will be at uh, Heart of the Hills camp to accommodate a much larger number of persons. We have approximately 60 in this group. And this is a program that's modeled somewhat after the Quartz Mountain Project. Uh, we anticipate uh, combining that camp with the uh, science and math camp next year and 
we'll have uh, approximately 600 students during a two-week period at Heart of the Hills. Other than that, you have our reports from the various uh, departments within uh, yeah. education. I'd be happy to address questions that you may have or after the uh, reports have been made by the departments. <coughs> Mr. Hoskin. Thank you, Madam Chair. There's been a lot of reports in the media about school consolidation lately, and, and it seems to me it reasonable to say it probably disproportionately impacts our people. I know in there's schools up in my area, White Oak and Cleora, mm -hmm. near my area. I wondered if, number one, I, it's on your old radar screen. Number two, do you, do you think the department or the nation has a role in maybe lobbying the legislature as we go into the next session to try to prevent this? I mean, it seems to me it, it's a bad thing. I think it breaks up communities, and uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. It's a very apt subject, a very appropriate subject, because we have uh, at least four of the K-8 districts, kindergarten through eighth grade districts, that uh, will start the year uh, in financial difficulty. Um, of course, there is not going to be any additional aid from the state. So whether or not they're able to continue to meet payroll, continue to function, will be directly dependent upon their ability to cut back and to be very frugal in their, in their spending. What we're planning in the department is immediately after school starts, because we have several new K-8 superintendents to host a workshop um, and go over the three key elements of keeping a school open, that's finance, finance, and finance, of how to um, more effectively use the money. Of course, we need to see, teach some how to less effectively steal money. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe we can uh, approach it from an, an intervention concept rather than a bailout concept. Now the, the last legislature, of course, did make provision for a uh, management process whereby if a K-8 school is in deep trouble with the State Board of Education, either from an academic standpoint or from a financial standpoint. The board may offer the school and the tribe, the tribe in whose jurisdiction the school is located, for the tribe to assume total operation of the school for a period of two years in an attempt to put them back on their feet. Uh, the local boards would uh, not function. It would be simply a memorandum of agreement between <coughs> the tribe and the State Board of Education. Of course, the third option that the State Board would have would be to close the school. So hopefully this would, um, for instance, in Cherokee County, uh, Lost City probably would not have closed had this legislation been in place early enough for the Cherokee Nation to intervene. So that's one bright spot. In other words, rather than just summarily closing a school and say, okay, that's all of it, you don't meet uh, uh, minimum requirements as far as accreditation, nor do you have enough money to meet your payroll or to pay your vendors, then the Cherokee Nation could, if they so choose, if they so chose to do so, uh, could enter into an agreement with the State Board to operate the school lock, stock, and barrel for two years in an attempt to either bring them back to a sound financial footing or a sound performance footing, or perhaps both. But we do have some schools that uh, that serve predominantly uh, Cherokee students that uh, have some rather 
bleak times ahead of them. We are meeting with uh, those superintendents. In fact, I have a meeting tomorrow with a, with a couple. And it, it's no secret. We might as well we might as well talk about those that are that are in imminent danger. Uh, Marble City is still in danger, uh, even though they're uh, they have weathered the storm of uh, losing almost a million dollars. But they have more money to lose because their 874 payments from restricted land, which when you get right down to it, is is provided by the Cherokee Nation. In other words, if it didn't have the restrictions, it wouldn't have the money. So uh, restricted land has been the lifeblood of a lot of our K-8 schools, especially in the south end of the nation. Um, the former uh, administration at that school uh, continued to count some of those students after they were no longer enrolled at uh, Marvin City. They may have been senior at Salazar, but they were still counted as 874 students and money was drawn on them. So that school is in the hole. Instead of receiving funds from 874, they receive credit against the debt. No, no money for, for operation. And that will go on for some time. Uh, Greasy School, across the hill in, in Adair County, uh, could not meet their last payroll, uh, their May payroll. They have received some state appropriated funds along with other schools, plus they received uh, some 874 monies that were due them from 1995, which was sort of a, hey, here's some money that they were not expecting. They'll be able to open school. Uh, whether or not they'll be able to close it remains to be seen. Uh, cross in Sequoia County, Belfont. Uh, Belfont has not taken advantage of, quite frankly, any external funding in the last few years. They have a new superintendent. He is a Cherokee citizen, Paul Pinkerton from Adair County, formerly of uh, assistant principal at uh, Stillwell High School, is superintendent at uh, Belfont. He's spending every day out visiting families and uh, trying to take advantage of every opportunity available through the Cherokee Nation as well as uh, state. And I have high hopes for that school. They have a they have about $175,000 in the bank right now to open school. Uh, they'll probably be able to make it this year. They have applied for a Head Start. They used to have our Head Start. They lost it several years ago because they did not follow the regulations. Uh, they've been funding Head Start on their own from their general fund. They can't continue to do that. So we will be visiting uh, Greasy and Belfont. Uh, several from Education Services will be visiting them uh, next week, including Verna from Head Start seeing what we can do about putting them back on track. Uh, getting into northern Adair County, uh, uh, Peavine uh, has, they have money to start with. It's kind of a, an on edge type situation. Um, going on up into uh, the northern section of the Cherokee Nation, uh, most K-8 schools will be on the verge of uh, you know, a funding adversity. Kenwood probably will be the one that will have the most money with which to operate because of uh, active participation in uh, external funding through the federal government and also through uh, public law 874, the restricted land, because there's so much restricted land surrounding them. So uh, it's going to be a, a monumental effort, but I really feel positive about it, because in, in most instances, there are some people that are, that are very, very serious and committed to saving the schools. And on the other side of the coin, there are some community members who are getting much more serious about uh, looking at their schools and, and improving their schools because I think the uh, trouble at uh, Lost City resulted in the closing of school. 
the publicity concerning uh, Marble City uh, was a wake-up call to uh, community members. We receive uh, requests frequently for, can you put an immersion school in our school? Uh, in some instances, we can. <coughs> Professor, you had a question. <coughs> yes, uh, Dr. Morton, you covered a lot, and I think you've answered some of my questions, but I guess the one last question I would ask is uh, how many K-8 K schools are there within the Cherokee Nation, and how many of them are 50% or more? Do you know off the top of your head? Off the top of the head, I do not know, but I'll get the information for you. That'd be interesting to know. How many K through eight schools they are within our jurisdictional boundaries? Again, I'll get the that percentages. Right. Even if you could break the percentages down even below 50%, that'd be nice enough. Okay. I don't like clear or I want to say that's like 20% uh, native population that go to school there. But it'd be interesting to see those uh, percentages and then how many schools are in our jurisdictional boundaries. Okay. Thank you. We'll get that for you. Okay. Dr. Cobb? I know that occasionally this will rise to the surface and my question is going to be um, is there any formal drawing plan for a second Sequoia type high school and if not does this situation with some of these schools bring that concept to the forefront in any of your conversations only in my office okay <laughs> <laughs> Only that that subject. I, I'm asked that question. That a lot. subject has been. Uh, and, and you know, even being from Washington County, I find it fascinating being that far away. I have people say, "Why don't y'all have a second Sequoia type high school?" You know, uh, surprisingly enough, that that question has uh, has arisen quite frequently in the last uh, six months. The answer would be, the VIA is not going to support uh, any other school. But uh, there is a movement uh, in America because of the failure of uh, cities as well as uh, rural districts to operate schools effectively, to take a new approach at schools. In fact, we uh, were represented at a meeting in Oklahoma City last week that was sponsored by the Kirkpatrick Foundation under the Creative Oklahoma uh, movement that proposes the actual contract of operation of schools, especially in rural areas, by a, an outside entity, including business and industry. Uh, not really like a <laughs> charter school, it's just a contract to operate the public school and would operate in lieu of local administration and in lieu of um, local school board. Now there are local advisory committees, but not local you know, executive type committees. And where those schools have been tried on a pilot basis, they made some amazing progress, not only in uh, improving the performance of the children, but improving the connectivity between the school and the community. Because by the fact that we have local boards of education, um, there's a disconnect in most instances between school and community. So, uh, uh, now the One. second part of your question is this. Second, second answer is this. Um, would it be possible for the Cherokee Nation to sponsor a school in the direction that American education is going now with outside sponsorship or contract sponsorship of schools? Um, I think the answer is yes for the near future. Especially if we decided to assume um, the leadership in turning a school around that's in trouble, that's been uh, 
you know, under MOA with State Board of Education and are able to do that, then I think that would pave the way for schools similar to Sequoia in, in different regions of the nation. Because here it has been the difference between kids doing well academically, getting outstanding scholarships, and dropping out or attending schools that do not offer uh, an adequate curriculum. One of our tribal youth counselors, I'm sure he would agree with you. So, <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Are there other questions? Yeah. Thank you. We have Head Start next. I think I saw her come in. <laughs> come sliding in. I'm just out of another meeting into this one. But I'm happy to field any questions that you may have uh, from my written report. And I, I do need to report that we still haven't heard on our review, and it's been three months. So I don't know what their time frame is. It's hurry up on our side of it, and then they take their yeah. time. Are there questions? Mr. Baker. No news is good news. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're we're saying. Thank you, um, Ms. Jordan. Mm -hmm. uh, do we yes. have do, do we have a day yet on our next meeting? Or we gonna Thursday. Oh, it is this yeah. Thursday. Yes. Okay. At yes. noon. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next with uh, Dr. Allen Butler Allen from J O N. Um, you have my report, and if there are any questions, I would be more than happy to answer. But before you ask me any questions, I do have some update on the legislation um, or the appropriations process through at the federal level. Of course, as if everyone well knows, um, Bush eliminated, zeroed out JOM. However, when the House marked it up, the latter part of June, they um, reinstated funding level at 21.4 million. Woohoo! That's very good. I think the national office and uh, organizations were asking for 24 million, so the House brought it down a little bit, but quite a bit of an increase from last or this year's appropriations of 16 mil. So that's the good news. The bad news is that the Senate side um, subcommittees are. You know, it's lame duck, and they're just at a standstill, and it's not going to proceed on more than likely in a markup um, situation. So we are, on a, we as Diane's programs are, on a continuing resolution. So our funding will be operated at the 08 level. However, you know, when they finally resolve it and on the Senate side and come to some terms, agreements, then we will find out exactly what where the level of funding is. So. That's good. We're still alive. But we'll probably go through this next year, too, <laughs> as we do every year. So, Mr. What is the funding for your program? What is the amount? Just for Cherokee Nation. Just for Cherokee Nation. Um, <clears throat> we've been given 1.7. So if you don't get refunded on the federal level, you have a 1.7 million budget. Correct. And. Um, the majority, the the majority of those monies go into our sub grants at 1.1 mil for the schools, the contract, the okay. subcontract. Okay, they go out to the school. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's used for the kids. Yes, and it's 1.1. Yes. Okay. Are there other questions, Dr. Cobb? So your um, the budget for the third quarter, 74 percent spent. Do you anticipate spending the entire budget? Well, we, we, our reimbursement claims from the schools come in June 30th. 30th. Yeah, so we're still, still catching, up. catching up. I'm trying to, so I, I, I really can't tell you how well they're going to spend. We encourage them year after year after year to spend down to zero budget. Okay. Because when it comes back to us and we don't do anything else with it, then we have to hand it back to bad. the tribe. So that's, right. that creates a bad exactly. situation. Okay. That's what so. I'm Thank you. Mr. Hoffman. Yeah, were, were you able to determine whether any of Oklahoma's congressional delegation was on that markup? Committee? You know, I'm so sorry. I knew you were going to ask that, and I, for, I just absolutely, uh, totally I, forgot I mean, to if do they, it. If any of our delegation were on that committee and for some reason didn't support making JOM from zero to something, 
Yeah. And I think uh, you know, what other, whatever wrath we can bring down on those members of Congress ought to be brought. Um, so, so if you can find that out. I, I will. I'm that. so very That's sorry. Okay. Um, both on the Senate side and the House side, even though I know it was a House markup, to the extent that any of our, either of our senators have uh, taken a position on that, I'd like to know that as well. Um, and then secondly, you know, you mentioned that you, you, you may go through this next year. It hadn't been the case that every presidential administration has zeroed out JOM. I know that certainly the Bush administration has. Well, over the past five years since I've been the manager for, uh, of the program, we've either had 50% uh, um, reduction in our budget or uh, funded minimally, you know, at 16 million. This year it looks really good at 21.4 million, but you know, of course, our student count was frozen in '95, which means that it's a it's per student basis, count basis. So we're really operating at a very, very low budget. Whereas our our popu our student population has increased by 10, 15 percent over the past, you know, um, 15 years. I would hope whatever administration is in there next would come out with something better than zero for their budget. I would I would think that perhaps that will be the likely case. Keep our fingers we're, crossed. Yeah, we're, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so now, if you don't get funded by this group and the group changes in November, all's not lost, right? We can go back to the table and talk to whoever the new people are. Well, if we, yeah, exactly, because we'll be operating, <laughs> that is if, you know, we'll be operating on a continuing resolution. But you know. you'll let us know if oh, we definitely. run out of money. I mean, this oh, is definitely. a pretty critical program. I know, I know. And I, and I was real concerned about, I, I'm getting a lot of calls from schools about school supplies. And, you know, our application is due August 1. And we're, we've, we've made a, um, a waiver statement saying, based on federal funding, this is what you need to do with your, your, your budget uh, revision for this year. However, it could be lower. It could be lower if we don't get funded as much so in you, this in '09. It doesn't sound like you have hardly any carryover. Well, we, we, yeah, we try to. What we've done in the past years is um, the sub grants take, like I said, the majority of our um, federal dollars. So if they don't spend down, and that's been the case for a while, then we've created this cultural resource fair where we bring in vendors and we invite the schools to come in. And we give them vouchers for them to spend during this cultural resource fair so that they can add to their libraries and curriculum materials or cultural, culture based books and materials and supplies. So that's been a really good, and I've reported out on that a couple of years now, it's been a real win win for the cottage industry, industry people as well as our schools to acquire some beautiful art objects as well as real usable. Um, curriculum tools, we call them tactile teaching tools, you know, for their schools. So and then that kind of spins down that budget there that is allocated for the um, subgrants. But yeah, it is critical. Every year we go through this. Uh, it's glory. I will keep you updated. I promise. I promise you, I will. <laughs> and I'm so sorry about that. I. Okay. I'll get it to you in the next day or so. Okay. Other questions? All right. Um, thank you. And next is Sequoia High School. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. You have my report. I just have a couple of things that I'd like to add to that just to update you on technology. Um, the, they're completing all of the, the installation of the computers and we're in the process now through an alternate funding route to um, be able to automate our library. So we received our quotes and we're getting ready to proceed with that. Um, and EOTS, we've had our meeting with them. We finally received validation of our POR from Facility Management OFMC in Albuquerque. And um, we're allowed to move forward on that. We've kind of been in a standstill. We're going to have to request additional time. Um, we had the budget impasse, and then we had them holding up on validation. So once we've received everything, um, we're ready to move forward with the library expansion as well as the three-classroom uh, addition, which we are at the pr 
point now, we continued to move forward with meetings so that we would, because we knew we were going to be a little bit behind. Um, so we are ready to present our 20% submittals, and they will actually go in next week to um, Albuquerque. And then we'll be able to wait on them again for that, and then we'll move forward with submittals as we go. Uh, but we are continuing to meet with uh, the staff that those rooms will be uh, responsible for, and they're coming in to have their input uh, as well. So it's been, a, it's been a neat process, and we're looking forward to getting that moving. We had 165 kids this past two weeks in our summer learning program. It was a, a very big success. Very impressed with the retention of the students. Um, typically in a summer program you lose a lot because it's easier to stay home and sleep. But we had a lot of kids that, that stuck it out and did well. <clears throat> a lot of good feedback from parents. A very good turnout uh, for the last day of where we actually showcased the event. We had everything from Cherokee cooking to leadership, robotics, culture, arts. We even had algebra in there. So there was a lot of good things that were going on. Um, the arts program, we had Jane Austen where the kids were actually taken down and they got to, to make pinch pots and things in her studio. Um, and a lot of Cherokee culture, the games and things that were taught. It was, it was a very outstanding program. We had kids from... Claremore, Holbert, Keys, Locust Grove, Tahlequah, and those are just a few of the ones that I got to meet as I went around from room to room. Um, so the kids were very engaged. It was really neat. Um, the kids that were in the uh, college prep course that we offered uh, from the other schools were just amazed at the things that we did with our kids and helping them even learn how to fill out ACT packets and apply for scholarships. So I'm sure they'll have some good information to take back to their schools. Um, part of that too, we was asked by a parent from Woodall School if we would consider incorporating into our after school boys and girls club um, the Lego robotics, which is what they did while they were up there during the two weeks. And they did some pretty amazing things with those robots during that time frame. Um, Starbase is going on this week. Dr. Morton mentioned the Arts Institute that's going on this week. And I have to say I'm very disappointed that we're not going to have 600 kids on our campus <laughs> next year uh, for that since it's going to Heart of the Hills. <clears throat> and a reminder, we have um, four students that are participating in the All-State Games. That will be that last week in uh, July and then the first day of August. Hunter Cunningham will play in baseball on the 28th. We'll do an all-employee email on times and locations. Uh, Lauren and Angel, I think, play that Wednesday night. And then Nathan's family plays on that Friday night in the football game. Um, risk management in case you get calls from parents that there's something major going on at Sequoia when the teachers come back and the kids will be later on but the, the day the teachers come back part of our training BIA requires is um, safety training it's a program that they call stand down at one point in time but there's a lot of things that are in, incorporated into that we're taking it a little, little bit further and it's something that we did a few years ago and got a lot of really good response not just from teachers but from parents too uh, appreciating the fact that we were taking their kids' safety into consideration. But that particular day will be, and the assessment's going on with just not just BIA, but the marshals as well, and they're coming in and doing a complete walkthrough of all of our buildings and the immersion as well, and then they're going to give us feedback on what we can do to make it a safer place for kids. Uh, and a lot of these folks have been involved with the Red Lake incident and bring back a lot of really good information. So there'll be quality uh, training that will be going on with teachers will actually have uh, an intruder, intruder scenario where they come on and the teachers hear the rounds in the building to know what it sounds like um, and know, can actually see what the response uh, is to be and then we'll be able to go back and question those folks and then see what actually how, how they should handle those type of situations. So it's a, it's a very good training uh, but it's also uh, training on what we could do in our classrooms to be safer. Uh, and actually had their input on the 20% submittals for the uh, BIA on the new building and the library in terms of uh, safety. So that's all I have, and I'll entertain any questions you might have. Mr. Buzzard? Yes, uh, Ms. Stanley, can you tell me or tell us from, from the budget highlights you have Sequoia certified 420 ISET students and you have. Uh, what, what are those acronyms? ISEP is the Indian Student Equalization Program. That's our base funding for uh, through the BIE. Okay, and SPED? Special Ed Students. Special okay. Education Students. And then students. the GT? Gifted and Talented Students. Okay. And ELO? Uh, that's our Education Line Officer. That's the person that comes out and certifies all of our counts. Okay. 
Thank you. And it's from the Oklahoma Area Office. You're welcome. Thank you. It's just it's easier to type in those acronyms. Yeah, well, I'm sure <laughs> we did with that acronym with BI take it into consideration. and Bureau, but it's sure. easier to do than that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, you know, a few years ago, we kicked around the idea of becoming a leadership school at Sequoia mm -hmm. High School. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that ever, what happened to that? We are following through with that. All of our students that graduate from Sequoia will, and then be with, they were sophomores this year, every student that gradu graduates from Sequoia from that group on will have had at least two leadership uh, courses that they've had to take. Uh, as well as the requirements that we have, which are above and beyond what the state requires. The state requires 23, we require 28. And some of those are uh, like a fifth English as opposed to four Englishes that the state requires. Uh, another aspect of, of being a leadership school is, and it ties into the initiatives of the tribe, but that, and that starts with this year's class, that every student that graduates will have to have 10 hours of community service uh, each school year. So we're already now mm -hmm. at the leadership school. Right. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Mr. Baker? Are we at 100% for school to start? Are we at 100%? No, but we will be by the first day. <laughs> we're getting there. I tell you what, all of these summer programs have just, I think we're as busy this summer as we are during the academic year. But we're getting there. Yes. Still got a few slots. A few slots, but we're getting there. We're doing our final. Um, as far as I know, unless any come up at the last minute, we usually always have one or two that that uh, decide to go somewhere else. If it, yeah. Gail Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, what are we doing to uh, lift up the on-campus curriculum for college prep at Sequoia with physics and calculus and those things? That we finally hired our, we've had a science position that's open, we finally hired a person and that person has those. So for next year's curriculum we will have physics, we will have um, trig, anatomy and physiology, we're going to open up, we'll have physics. So we're actually, and with the robotics course we're still in the process of doing the contract with NSU to have uh, Mr. Cole come in and teach the robotics course which they'll get dual credit for from Northeastern and from Sequoia. And we're actually exploring with our other coursework, our other core subjects, um, looking at AP courses for each of those areas. But you would keep, like for the BC students, you would keep that other That doesn't course. change any of the courses that we have. But you would allow that, I mean, you would you wouldn't just have AP Physics, you would have Physics and AP Physics right. to allow them right. to have, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Others? Dr. Cobb? How are things in Oxford? Oxford's doing very well, Good. very well. Actually one of the nationally ranked magazines has him right now listed as the backup quarterback, so he's Good. moving up the ladder. Good. Good. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you. Next we have the Cultural Resources Center Director's Report from Dr. Sly. I'll see how you We have been finishing up this past month our camps. Um, those were successful in that the communities were very accepting of them. Um, we didn't have the attendance we, have the, we normally have here in Tahlequah, but it was because of our um, lead time and, and getting those out there and getting the camps all set. So, um, should we do them next year? Communities are already contacting us and wanted us to be there. So the staff did a very good job out there in those camps. Uh, again, we're still setting up our fall classes. We should have those out to you by next uh, committee meeting and have those set. So uh, they'll begin October 1. Our online classes will begin September, the week of September 8. So. Um, those will be available. So again, if you have a specific community that hasn't contacted us, um, happen to do so, give us a contact person and we'll talk to them about getting a class out there. We have had no luck in going to Mr. Anglin and <laughs> up toward Copan. We go to South Coffeeville a lot, but Copan, we go occasionally to Bartlesville. No water, not much there either. So. I don't know if you're, you know, community. We can't. We couldn't find a place at Blue Jacket. Um, so uh, and no place. There was no uh, facility at Fairland. 
So we're out there looking and we know some of the situations. Um, so if you all know of a place, it can be a community site, that maybe even a church that would allow us to have a class, then, you know, contact us. Because we do try to get our services out to all the nine districts and to areas where they may not have had an opportunity to participate earlier. Okay. I'll take any questions you might have. Are there questions? No. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, next we have old business. There is none. And so moving on to new business, and there is none. So I would entertain it. <laughs> <laughs> Announcements. <laughs> Announcements, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. If you'd like to attend our uh, Trello Pierce conference, which is September 22nd through the 25th in Little Rock, I urge you to sign up. Gail has registration information. And we will have, it'll be in Little Rock the last full week of September. One of our keynotes will be by our chairperson, entitled Full Bloods and Mixed Bloods, taking a second look at the Cherokee story. Dr. Charles Bolton from the University of Arkansas will discuss before the Trail of Tears, Cherokee removal to Arkansas. We will have a presentation of Seminoles, Chickasaws, and so forth, and some of the other tribes. So, I urge each of you to attend if possible, including the guests. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Two o'clock in five minutes, we will convene for the subcommittee for ENF on the PAC. Um, and then following that, if anyone wants to stay, uh, I know that there's actually one going to be scheduled for July 31st, sometime that day before around our committee meetings. But if you'd rather go ahead and get it done now, the staff will be here to do the emergency management training that they're requesting many of us that for some whatever grant compliance or something they're asking that we all get trained on it it'll be an hour or less so thank you Madam Chair. Mr. Buzzer did you have anything about Chanel that you wanted to oh, bring yes. up at this point? Yeah. Yes before everybody leaves um, has anybody thought of a date to take up a uh, take the tour to go to Chilanco? Yes Mr. Baker. I don't have a date but someone did suggest that if there's not any more than seven people want to go from this area, that maybe you can take the tribal plane, make it a lot easier to fly into Ark City, which is only three or four miles away. And then some of the others, such as Dr. Cobb said he could drive from Bartlesville. It's easier to drive it here. And I'd be happy to drive from Oklahoma City to make them. But that's just a thought in case you didn't want to drive that far. I'm not that far up there. Uh, I don't know if any, anybody got a suggestion for a date that they'd like to go. I'm pretty flexible on any days. So. I was, I know, suggesting maybe the day after committee meetings on August 1st or something like that if it was, you know, but I was again thinking along the lines that maybe we would all be here at that time. If that's not a requirement, then That was August the 1st. That's on a Friday. I'll be in Missouri. I didn't know that. I won't be in Missouri. Make them all driving around. Yeah. That whole week. Shall we adjourn this meeting and we can uh, talk about this? Uh, you want to just do it by email and figure yeah. it out? Yeah. I have a water meeting. I'll be in Oklahoma City. I'll move we adjourn. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. That's fine.